Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast. I'm here as always with my good friend, Dan Wiseman. And we've also got a special guest with us today, the one and only Aaron Clark, coach. First of all, before I get to Dan, how are you doing, Aaron? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Thank you. Yeah, lovely to be back again, boys. Lovely to, uh, to be on screen with you both. You know how much I love doing that. So thanks for having me back. Not a problem, mate. But before we get into it, let's, let's, let's get the plug out of the way first, mate. I really, you know, when we, when we, yes. we really appreciate having you come on. Um, but, and you haven't asked us for this, and I know I texted you earlier, but um, it only feels right when there's something great to promote. Um, first of all, if you guys are looking to get into shape, Aaron's the guy. He's helped me no end. Um, he is, he is the goated uh, PT out there. You guys need to hit him up for all that. But as well, another podcast coming to the Villa Sphere, but this one, it, it's got a bit of a twist on it, Aaron. So before we get into, the crux of this podcast let us know what you guys are doing yeah yeah no problem so uh, yeah appreciate that mate thanks for the shout out um so yeah Holt B6 um it's a coin on Holt End uh B6 being Villa Park where we're based so just a kind of cushy little uh name but what, what it represents is um I guess it's it's about promoting mental health within the Villa community and promoting some awareness promoting some support some guidance some top tips some conversations I guess around mental health and well-being uh, for a lot of lads, for a lot of dads, you know, uh, older gentlemen, particularly in the Villa community, it's very difficult to talk about. So the podcast aims to just encourage conversation around it, talk about different experiences, talk about how we do things, why we do things, what we struggle with, why we struggle with it, what we can do to make it better, etc. cetera. Um, and I guess I just wanted to put all of that under a nice kind of engaging kind of logo. So we've got a series of kit, home and away, and a third kit. Um, all designed by a really top lad called Jason, who's going to join me on the first podcast for that. Um, it's just going to be about football. We'll talk about Villa. We'll talk about, you know, how dire we are or how great we are. But actually, <laughs> underneath all of that, the conversation is about encouraging people to talk about how they feel and, and, and the emotions that we experience as, as lads, um, particularly in that football industry, because it is quite taboo, you know, um, doesn't get spoken about a lot. So, yeah, it's just a platform to, to raise awareness, really, um, and do the right thing as, as often as I can, really. I just want to try and make an impact. If I can change one man's life who watches it, then that's job done. So, uh, yeah, there'll be some interesting stuff going on. I know you boys are going to join me at some point in the next few months on the podcast. So um, it'll be good, mate. I, you know, and I'm not just, you know, doing the same conversation every week. It'll be very much uh, different special guests and, and top profile guests, you know, really people that want to come on and really talk about um, something that's quite serious. So, um, yeah, that's what it is. So hope we six. Uh, I can give it a follow. I much appreciate the support and I'm looking forward to doing the first episode for sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Links will be in the description, guys, so you can check out the socials. Uh, and it, it's just a testament to what a great guy Aaron is, honestly. Um, yep. So, guys, if you're not following it, you should be. Everybody who's listening to this is probably already following Aaron's personal because if you're not, then what are you doing? Because, again, just another great guy uh, to be following. Exactly. But, yeah, guys, we have, as I said, we haven't really spoke about the season too much. We've been doing a bit of looking ahead, but I think in order to to properly look ahead and 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 enjoy and 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 just you know think of all the things that we can imagine about what's going to come with next season, we kind of have to have that final sort of debrief, decompress as to what happened. Dan, fourteenth place last season. It's not the best. It's not the worst. Um, when you look at the table, mate, and you see that Brentford. Uh, and Brighton are finishing above you, though. It, you can't really say you've had a successful season, can you? No, mate. I think as, as seasons go, it's. Um, I think we'll we'll put it nicely. We'll call it a building block. I think that's that's a good. That's a nice way to call, like summarize it, isn't it? Um, step one: um, the Gerard era is underway. Um, you never want to put too much expectation on a manager that joins midway through a season. It's very much settle the ship, get it stable, get through to the end of the season, start building some foundations. You know, start unraveling your philosophy on the training ground and then as soon as May hits it's all all guns blazing all steam ahead focusing on August and I think to look ahead to the next season and look at what Villa need to improve on in order to do that you've got to look back haven't you so this is what this is about it's about looking back on last season picking out what was good what was not so good what went well what didn't and then trying to find ways that Villa can learn from that and hopefully finish I think top half has, has got to be the sort of the goalpost hasn't it really for next season yeah I mean Aaron Surely, like the the first sort of the well, so far really up in, in Stephen Gerrard's reign is is a free hit, right? You know, I don't think anybody expected him to to come in and take the reins and and have us finish in the top half as nice as that would have been. But 
is it fair to say that there's foundations have been placed within this almost right off season that yeah um yeah i think i think Gerard coming in mid season like dan says rightly says it was a difficult it's a difficult job for any manager to just come in and try and make a difference you know um i think a lot of the expectation was that Gerard would come in and we would just progress and continue to progress and there'd be no failures but actually foundation yes was set under the smith era but Gerard needs time too you know these aren't Gerard's players um we, we're getting more and more of that as we go but you know, he, he didn't create that kind of format, that setup, that tactical knowledge, that, that everything that was existing already, that wasn't Gerard. So he needed time to be able to implement his own stuff. That's why we bring in a new coach to implement new foundations and understand, you know, new techniques and moving forward. So um, for me, yes, definitely. Um, I'm impressed with what Gerard's done, if I'm honest. 14th doesn't represent, you know, it doesn't represent the best of positions, but actually there's a lot of progression elsewhere. We're seeing progression with the players we're bringing in. We're seeing progression with the way we want to play. You can see the way that we want to play and how Gerard wants to set up. And it's very exciting. I like, I like what he's trying to do. He's tried to implement what he wants us to play like with Dean Smith players a lot of the time. And so I think this summer, you know, is really important in, in regards of Gerard getting in the right men who he wants to be able to play those positions. We've seen the recruitment so far that he's, he's looking to get those men in and he's doing very well at it at the moment. And I still think there's two or three more to arrive. Um, and it's looking good. So I, I can't I can't fault Gerard. I, you know, a lot of fans did expect him to come in and take us to top six. But you know, for me, that's unrealistic. You know, it's just that's just not gonna happen. But a top 10 finish for me this season coming would be a huge progression, would be a huge statement, you know, and I think that's exactly what what we'll do. We'll get top 10. Um, but I think just a little bit of realism, a little bit of uh, time and a little bit of lenience with him being able to get to where he really wants us to be and finding that elite level. Because we will find it, you know, as long as Gerard's our manager, players will come. And, uh, and I'm excited by that. I think we've seen that already with the players that we've brought in. I think almost impressed, like, you know, the, the fact that we get a Coutinho and a Dean in, like, early doors in the project, I think kind of shows how this could go and where it could go. And then to, to go and add on, you know, Coutinho coming permanently, being able to haggle a really good fee on that, signing somebody like Bubakar Kamara, which, again, it feels so surreal. I can't wait to see this guy play um, at the start of next season. That's kind of, it, it's put a shine on the project, hasn't it? And I don't, you know, I think it's so easy to be really short-sighted and go, well, you know, 14th place, it sucked. I, I think, to be fair, and there was legitimate concerns during times in this, during last season, Dan, there was a few times where we were sat on the podcast going, sure, I mean, surely we're not looking over our shoulder, knowing fully well that we were looking over our shoulder at times. And it almost, it, it was one of them things on Twitter, everyone was going, you're talking like, like, we're manifesting this relegation fight, but like, you are only like, you know, they say you're, you're what, two paychecks away from being homeless. Like, we were like two losses away from being in a relegation yeah. fight. Like, <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right, mate. It's it's one of those where um, we love a drama, don't we, as Villa fans? We love a drama. It's either going absolutely brilliantly or it's absolutely terrible. It's crisis or it's euphoria. We're never usually anywhere in the middle. Uh, and that's why we love it, isn't it? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think just to sort of touch on what Aaron said about the pull of Gerard, I think that's, that's a very good point. And I think that's why we will ultimately see year-on-year -year progression because we can rely on the players coming through the door to get better and better. Uh, I think Dean Smith had a very good pull domestically. Like, you know, the, the pull of Aston Villa here in England was still very much alive, you know, picking up the likes of Danny Ings and, and stuff like that at, the, the, at last season and bringing, those, bringing in a lot of big names. I think even if you go back to the sort of the season before last, and I know, I know it didn't end very well, but Ross Barkley is still a very relatively big name on the English circuit coming in from Chelsea. So we were able to pull in players from the Premier League, but what Gerrard's done is take Villa to the continent and make it a really appealing place for like top level stars to come in and play football. So really excited see how that goes um but yeah you're right mate in that uh hopefully we won't do too much looking over our shoulder this year i think um you know i always reference gerald's time at rangers in that he came into a side which had all the tools to go and like you know he had the size of the club the, the finances were there to go out and challenge celtic but it wasn't it's never that easy to build a club up to a level where you want to get it to at the sort of the end of the road and it took him three or four seasons two or three without silverware um to finally pip celtic um and then obviously you've seen the groundwork of what he's built at, at rangers has gone on to like you know Giovan Bronkos has taken what Joe did and ran with it. And so 
that's what I've always got reference. You think how easy it must be to take, you know, Rangers from your Aberdeens and your Dundees and stuff like that to put them on a par with Celtic. It, it just goes to show that in football, it's, it, you know, we always say, mate, it's not football manager in it. So it's like, it takes two or three seasons sometimes just, and I, I the one thing I hope is that we give Gerald the patience because if anyone can do this, I, I do think it's him. And it's not just Gerard, though, is it? You know, I think the fact that we went out and got the likes of Critchley, uh, Adam, and obviously we know very well how how big this sort of coaching staff is with the likes of Kurtz. Um, there's Danks, who's still about, I think, you know, McPhee. It feels like the work that they can do right now, and it's so cliche, and I think, we, to be fair, we've had a few people in the comments saying, what's the difference? Like, you know, because we've been saying for months, Dan, pre-season give them pre-season it's gonna like everybody's gonna be on board by pre-season and some people have kind of rightly questioned and gone well why can't they get this over like across during the season but I think ultimately it's down to like minutes on the grass and you don't actually get that many during the season the coaching staff having that sorted as early as well because you know last season we had we had uh, we had JT go the year before Richard O'Kelly last year how important is it as that you know, going into this, again, it seems like we've got a really strong cohort of coaches that I think are, are looking to just hit the ground running with these, like, you know, world-class players that we've got coming through the doors as well. Yeah, it's essential. You know, if you look at you look at how things have started this summer, come the end of last season to now, and potentially what we're going to do in the next few months, it's, it makes last pre-season last year look, look Sunday league. You know, um, last season, pre-season was, was abysmal, you know, the whole summer was talked about Jack. We lost some vital coaching staff. Morale was down. We had injuries. Preseason was diabolically organised. You know, it was really, really dire. It was probably the worst preseason that any club has ever had in, in its history. Yeah. You know, and this season, we bought four players in before the transfer windows even opened. We had a replacement for Beal within 24 hours. He was appointed. Decision was made. You know, we are a different gravy this year. There's no doubt about it. And, and for me... That you know that that comes from that comes from the kind of aura that Gerard brings. Perslow wanted Gerard, so I don't think Gerard's job is is up for grabs. Even if there's a little failure in the next next season or two, I, I, I seriously don't think that's an option for per Perslow. I think Gerard is here for long term if he succeeds and he does well. Um, you know, and, and I'm excited by that. But it is it's a complete a complete comparison to last year. You know, we are we are a club that is going places and, and you can see now we're off to Australia. When, when was the last time we went as far as that to do a pre-season tour? Playing yeah. United, yeah. Leeds. Very good point. You know, Very good point. We just didn't do that. Our biggest, our biggest pre-season game was against Odensa, who happened to be in UK in the end of August before we kicked yeah. off. Like, you know, it, 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 we are a different gravy now. And, and the players that we're bringing in will be signing for that, for that pull, for that engagement. They know what the club's plans are. They know what pre-season is going to be about. They know what the season is going to look like. They know the financial pool. They know the stuff that's going on behind the scenes and they want to be a part of it. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing with recruitment, and I will say it, and I've said it a few times on Twitter already, is that, you know, we are, we are gone with the days of players coming in to be backup. We are, we are done with that ethos. We are done with that mentality. No player is coming to this club now to sit on that bench and just be there if they are needed. Players are coming in at the same quality, at the same level, all elitist mindsets, ready to be able to be available at any given point whenever asked to do so. You know, we need competition in every position. But that's not to say that someone is an understudy. You know, if you're playing well in training and you're better than the man that's been playing the last six games, you'll start because you are of the same quality. You just haven't had the chances of late because the person next to you has done better in training. So this mindset the fans have, this old school mindset needs to change. And I've said it a few times today as a few people like, who is he replacing? Nobody's replacing anybody. You know, nobody is replacing anybody. Everybody's coming in to, to get their foot in the door and give it a good shot. And that will encourage players. 80% of professionals will want to be involved in that sort of thing. You know, you get your kind of, oh, let's think of a player that's not really into that. Your Carlton Coles of the day that don't want to do that. They're quite happy just to earn a big packet and chill and play a bit of football. And, you know, but the 80% of professionals these days don't want that. They want to be involved. They want competition. They want challenge. And so that's what we'll be recruiting for this year. And we can see that already so far. Um, and I'm buzzing with that. Buzzing. Do you, do you believe that there is genuinely 
competition of that because you know, like you guys know how much I love Morgan Sanson. How's this guy not getting in the team? It, you know, and I hate to be the guy that's like, oh, you know, John McGinn didn't have a brilliant season because you know everybody's been that guy at some point. But you know, there have been a few occasions where I've I've, I've sat there and gone, how is this guy not getting a chance? You know, he looks great to me every time he comes on. It, like. Yeah. Do you do you genuinely believe it's a, like I mean maybe it's an attitude thing with Sanson like you know we don't know it, it it'd be yeah. unfair to to label him as a bad egg when we barely get to see him and, and and barely hear anything from him but I don't know to me it kind of seems like Gerald has his favourites I don't think Sanson's a bad egg but I think he maybe got off on the wrong foot when he came in I think there was a little bit of little bit of specialism a little bit of an ego. Um, I think that was present, but he's probably settled in, and I think he's I think he's happy enough. But every player wants to be getting game time. But there is something underlying that isn't obvious to anybody other than those involved directly with Sanson and the club that that is stopping him from getting game time. You know, he is a quality player. We've seen that on occasions when he's come on. He's not made a difference, but he's certainly impacted a game. You can see the quality. His ball retention is phenomenal. You know, he knows what he's doing and there's a player in there. But for some reason, despite John McGinn's lack of performances, despite the Camber being injured, despite Dougie Louise being a bit a bit ad hoc and a bit kind of spontaneous with how he's going to play, he's still not been able to get himself in there. And I, I just don't know why that is. Someone will know and there'll be a good reason for it, I'm sure. Um, but I'm just not so sure, mate. But I, I like Sanson. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy for him to stay. And maybe with Kamara coming in, his old buddy at Marseille could be a little bit of a link and a, and a get back together gang kind of thing there. I don't know. Who knows? Um, interesting to see what happens, really. I think pre-season will dictate where Sanson goes. If he has a good pre-season and doesn't impress him, then he might stay around. But if he doesn't, then he'll, he'll be off, I'm sure. It's such a depressed market, though, isn't it? Like I was thinking earlier, like, you know, <laughs> Villa Twitter seems to think you can get 100 million for selling El Ghazi and Trezeguet and like... That, like the reality of the situation is that's not true. You look at Paul Pogba, you look at Angel Di Maria, you look at Christian Eriksen. I guess there's maybe an exception to that, but there's so many top quality players that are running their contracts down and and kind of taking the power into their own hands in regards to transfers and stuff. You sign, you know, like Wes. We're absolutely strapped to Wesley until 2025. There is nobody buying that man. Nobody's going to touch that kid with a barge pole. And it's a shame because, as everybody knows, this is the Wesley Filler podcast. We absolutely adore the man. But nobody's going to touch him. He's, he's awful. He's had a terrible spell at International. And it's, it's a really interesting one. You know, there's people talking about loans. OK, you can if you loan, maybe you save a bit of market value. But like, it, it, as I say, it's a depressed market. Nobody's going to want to buy these players and certainly not for a lot of money. But it almost looks as if Dan... We have to get these, like, you know, the three million you get for Trezeguet or the, 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 the four million you get for El Ghazi or, or Bertie. You, like, we need that money to, to not only just, like, free up money in terms of wages, which I think is, is arguably more important than transfer fees. But if we're going to get a few more bodies in, you know, we kind of need to cut our ties, don't we, with, with some of these people? A hundred percent, and you totally get why players do choose to run their contract con, like contracts down. Sorry, because from a financial point of view, personally, it makes more sense because you can either leave the season before on a cut price deal, or wait until your contract runs down, just go to a club of your choosing, and you re- normally normally you've got more choice about where you go because you haven't got to worry about your like you know the club you're joining having to pay a fee. And then you get a, like a heftier signing on bonus. And obviously there's this one, we call them free transfers in football, but they're anything but because normally you pay in order to tempt the player to join you, you pay a higher signing on fee. And so the player can either go, well, I can either wait around here for an extra year and then earn myself an extra five or 10 million pounds in a signing on fee by going to a big club or my club can take seven or 8 million for me now and I'll get booted at like, and I get less for it. So like, you know, like now the inflated sort of prices in the game mean that we have this sort of phenomenon. So normally 
but you're in a situation now where any kind of money you can get from a player where realistically you don't think there's much of a future for them, you have to take it because otherwise they will just run that con- that contract down and you'll get it for nothing. And realistically, like we we know, like Trezeguet scored some some good goals for us. I think in a better situation, if he had two or three years left on that deal, we obviously get more than two or three million pounds for him. But in this situation, as I, as I said. Um, you can't be picky and choosy in these situations. If a club is willing to pay for a player with a year left on his deal, I think even if it's a bit, little bit disgruntling to do it, you've got to take that money sometimes, mate. Yeah. yeah. I think I think the case with Trezeguet and, and will be with Anwar, will be with other players perhaps that leave, is that we overpaid. We overpaid for Trez, in my opinion. You know, we yeah. were a club that were desperate for a player and there wasn't a lot available because there was nothing to pull those types of players to Villa at that time. You know, Trez was the, oh, he's doing really well on the continent, but not a lot of people know about him. Pretty cool name that he has on his shirt. But his actual name isn't Trezeguet, it's Mohamed Hassan. You know, like, he's cool. Bit of a commercial, bring him in. And, and he, he's not great. Yes, he scored some good goals for us. He's a workhorse. I've always admired his effort and his, and his you know, his balls. He, he's always been a good kind of um, workhorse for sure, but he's not quality. So two or three million for Trez with one year left is actually not a bad deal. You know, someone that's been out on loan and done okay in the Turkish leagues, he's not said it alike. You know what I mean? So, you know, people are saying, oh, we could at least get back what we paid for him. In my opinion, we overpaid for him. Matty Target's the yeah. same. We've got 15 mil for Matty Target. We that's overpay done. for Matty Target. So 15 million for me for Target right now is bloody good money. In my opinion, he's seven to eight mil tops. The guy can't play in front of big crowds. He bottles it under pressure. Like, you know, that isn't what we want at our club. So for me, it's about perspective. You know, forget your values on football manager. Let's be real here. The value of the players that we're selling is about right. And I'm sure there'll be a few more players that leave the club that will go for way less than what people want for him. But that is the value in today's market. You know, that, that, is, that is it. And, and I don't think there's any debate in that, in my opinion. I, you know, some people might disagree, but I think two to three million for Trez is, is pretty good money. Certainly helps pay for something elsewhere. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and it's what it frees up as well. I mean, I can't imagine he was on a lot of money. I'm going to speculate like 50 grand, which is Tops. abhorrent, but, you know, for, for, for the kind of player he is. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, when you look at, I think it's to be fair, it's gone a bit quiet on the recruitment front, hasn't it? You know, and, and Villa seem to be operating completely differently with this regime and, and sort of how they're going about the transfers. And realistically, if somebody's going to sign, we are not going to know until like the final hour, which kind of makes what we do a little bit difficult, Dan. Um, but who I know we did it, we did a midfield episode last week, Dan. We kind of spoke about Gallagher and Chamberlain. Gallagher's head's kind of reared again in the in from Ashley Priest, which again, you know, I don't really think you can take much of what he says in terms of transfers, you know, too seriously. You know, Ash is a great guy, but the male seem to miss the mark more than they hit it. With Douglas Louise, again, you know, and today, you know, reports have been saying Douglas Louise, his agents have been speaking with the people at Roma, talking about a, a 25 million euro deal. Um, and there's been this debate do you sell Douglas for 20, uh, which 20, mil, 20 pounds, 20 million pounds, essentially, and bring Gallagher in for this reported 30 mil? I don't, I don't know where I sit on that. I, I really like Gallagher. And again, you know, you guys can watch the previous episode to kind of see where me and Dan sit on that. But I don't think that's good business at all. It's, it's one of those where all, all I'll say on that is that like Douglas Louise is a player that if his head's turned and his heart isn't in it, I'd worry about. I, I like, I, I saw, I think we've seen a little bit with, with Douglas that um, he's not necessarily the strongest world and stuff like that. I think if, if he's happy and he's very secure and he feels in, in a comfortable place and he can enjoy his football. And I think like, you know, if, if he does go to Roma, uh, obviously he'll have Matic and the like sitting behind him and he can play a little bit higher and I'm sure he'll find that. But if his head's turning and his heart isn't in it and we want to try and put him in the middle of that part next season, that is something that perhaps I would worry about. And I didn't, you know, I turned my sort of nose up at Gallagher, not because of the player he is. I think he's fantastic, but I just thought that Chelsea would demand a very high price for him. Um, and £30, pounds, to be honest, I think is quite respectable. Uh, £30, pounds, that would be very respectable. £30 <laughs> yes, million. Pounds. 30 quid, yeah, I'll have him. I'll have him. Um, 
30 million quid, mate. Um, I don't think that's bad. I really don't. I think coming from a big club like Chelsea, English tax, young kid and everything like that. Um, I mean, like, you know, if, if you're being totally honest, like it, it seems crazy that we're sort of looking at 30 million quid for a lad that's just come off a season that on loan at Palace and you think, oh, what a steal. But such is the market that we're in. And I, I do think yeah. that, you know, if, if it was... 25 million you could let Louise go for if he, if his heart's not in it he doesn't want to be there and I think look like if, if you're him you'd be desperate to go and play somewhere like that and play higher up the pitch and play somewhere where you, you know you've got that stability behind you, behind him for too long he's sort of been a scapegoat of Villa he's, he's been played out of position and I'm sure he's been quite disgruntled at that at points um, and you know what, if it's like you, you do that and a guy like Gallagher comes in who is a very different type of player, um, offers a bit more tenacity, which I think is the big box we have to tick in this midfield is I think we were too easy, too soft in that midfield. We've got to be hungry, we've got to be nastier, play with a little bit more energy. And I think Gallagher would bring you that. And if that comes at a five million pound, like sort of like loss, I don't think that's bad going. What are you saying, Aaron? Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with Dan, to be fair. Yeah. Um... But I'm going to flip it completely on its head and say that I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if Dougie didn't leave at all this summer. Um, you know, there, I, think, I think you're right with being heads turning. I think that there's been a lot of talk about this contract that he should have been signing really last season and didn't, hasn't done so far. Lots of discussions, contracts on the table, but it's not being touched or looked at. Um, but I think there are things uh, in a personal sense for Dougie that keep him in the UK. Um, this seemingly blossoming relationship with our female footballer, Alicia, um, whether she moves on, whether she stays put. Um, he seems a very family man. And I know from his background, his culture, his upbringing, family is really important. Loved ones are really important. If Alicia doesn't move, I don't know whether he deal with being abroad and not being near her. I don't know. Um, that'll be an interesting dynamic to see whether... If, if he goes, she goes. Don't be surprised if he goes, she goes. And if he stays, she stays. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But I, I think I think we'll see him in pre-season. I think we'll see Dougie involved in his pre-season. And maybe then he can see that Gerard plans to play him in this more upright position, this further up the field position, because we have the players in now, Kamara, to do that job that Dougie was asked to do on so many occasions and just didn't quite fulfil to the maximum. Um because Dougie was great in that number eight position in a few times. Yeah, so good. No, he mm -hmm. looked he looked really good, and and I I would be really sad to see him go. I would. I, th I think he's a I think he's a softy. There's this hard part of Dougie too, but I think he's a big softy, and and I and I like him. I, I'm a, I'm a fan of Dougie Louise, and I'd I'd like him to stay. But you know, if someone comes in and offers offers us 30, 25 mil. Uh, and it's Champions League football, and it's working with a coach like Mourinho. I think he goes, but I don't. Yeah. I don't think it's as black and white as what we're seeing. I, I think there's there's more to it. Um, you know, he could sign a contract next week, and then he stays for another four years, and it's all put to bed. So um, who knows? Who knows? But I, I like Dougie. I do like Dougie, and I'm Conor Gallagher just for just for the shout. I'd love him at Villa, mate. I bloody love him. I think he's fantastic. I think he is hellish exciting and I think he would come in and give Ramsey a good run for his money and I think that's what Ramsey needs to be a, to be a better player um yeah I, I'd love him at Villa and he's English you know and he'll be an international fully fledged international in 18 months time for sure if he keeps going as he's going so I'm going to put both of you on the spot now just before we end Ooh. this dream transfer one guy both get it can't be Colin Gallagher and it can't be Mr. Weiss <laughs> contract uh, I'll go to Dan first. Dan, the one signing that Villa, in your mind, absolutely needs to get done before the start of the season. That is a great question, mate. That is a great question. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I've always said this, you need to get your own house in order. I want to see Carney Chippenmaker. I know it's a controversial, it feels like a controversial opinion to say this, but I want to see Carney Chippenmaker sign. Honestly, that would feel like a new signing for me. I think once you get that boy a full season with a fresh deal, he feels settled. I think, we, like, honestly, he goes to the moon. Um, I really do. That's a really interesting question though, mate. Um, and... Um, I think that midfield spot is probably 
what I would look at. I also want to see someone coming at left back. So maybe I'll say that. I think I really like the couple of guys that we were looking at um, out in Liga on. And I think if we can really say to our scouting team, go on, earn your money, go out there, dig us a gem out of out of the like you know continental Europe, find us guy that can come in and, and sort of is young, is willing to learn, he's going to put a pressure a bit of pressure on Luca Dean, isn't going to be a massive drop off. I think that would be brilliant. And I think. You know, we, we spoke a little while ago about a couple of profiles that we're looking at. And I, I was really excited in particular by uh, by Sergio Gomez at Anderlecht, mate. And I think to uh, to link back to another episode, if you guys hadn't seen that, Dan did um, Dan and I did a little review on a couple of targets that could come in and replace Matty Target. Hey, um, then I'm going to say Sergio Gomez would be my pick, mate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's a cop out, but I'll, I'll allow it. Aaron, who is yes. your one guy? Who is your one guy? So uh, I'm going with unrealistic, but realistic because that's that's how Villa are operating now. More and more things are becoming more realistic and doable. So for me, Watkins and Ings I like, but for me there needs to be a third a third striker that knows where the goal is. And um, whether that's Archer, I'm I'm unsure. I feel like psychologically there's a lot of development there to be done. He's still a baby throwing him into the big league in the Premier League. I'm sure he'll score goals, but what other damage will it do for kind of development, psychology? I don't know. So for me, maybe another loan for Archer is, is a good idea, but he has a good preseason. Let's see where that takes us. So take Archer out of the picture. Imagine he doesn't exist and he's doing well somewhere else and scoring 30 goals a season on loan somewhere. Uh, for me, it's got to be it's got to be a big striker, mate. It's got to be a, a big number nine. Um, when I say big number nine, it doesn't mean in size-wise. That means in figure, you know, feet. I think there's 40, 50 million there to splash out on a big, a big dog, uh, someone who can score goals. And I don't know who that is, um, but if I'm going unrealistic, I'd love Jesus. I'd love Jesus. I really would. I'd love us I to think... take City's Jesus and, and make him a part of that Brazilian core that we seem to be setting up. Imagine that. Diego Carlos, Coutinho, Dougie Luiz, Jesus. Unreal. That gives Unback me it. the heebie-jeebies. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm, Unback I'm it. moist thinking about it. Like, that would be insane. Yeah. You know? Doug, uh, the problem for me is, and the reason I say that, Dan, is because Watkins and Ings are good players, you know? Ings works hard, hasn't put them away. Ollie Watkins is a good holder up of the ball, but he couldn't hit a barn door this season. So, you know, we need more clinical in that top third. We need someone yeah. that can put the ball in the back of the net at every opportunity, or at nine times out of ten, it's a goal. And we haven't had that. And I think Gerard will be aware of that, and he'll want to change it. Yeah, I think Jesus, like, he's he's the guy this year. Like, if he, if he wants to get out of City, he can call up him and his agent any top club and, you know, who needs a striker and he's the go-to guy because I think, yeah. you know, I think, like, you know, we, we spoke about it the other day, didn't we, Dan? Like, Liverpool have gambled early on, on Nunes. City have got Haaland in, guaranteed to hit the ground running. I mean, it, there's only really Cam Archer really about who you'd say is a top striker. Um, you know, but he's not available uh, for the yeah. teams. You know, it's, it's a it's a difficult one for uh, for to, to recruit for. And I think you know you've seen the likes of Chelsea, Arsenal, Spurs all linked with Jesus because of the way he leads a press. He's so like he fits the system so well, and I, I, I it'd be rude of me to say he's not, you know, a, a clinical striker because he's got nearly 100 goals for Manchester City, but um, he hasn't been the guy that they expected to supersede Aguero, but he's a system player. And, you know, you're seeing what Arteta's building, you're seeing what Conte's building, yeah. pressing from the front, Jesus is the man. And I think, yeah, that'd be fantastic if we could get him. Don't think we will, but, you know, we can all dream. No, I, I don't but... think we will either, mate. And, and that's the honest opinion. I don't think we will. I think he's just above where we are looking. I think he's yeah. the next step. But if we're going to really go for it, then why the hell not? You know, I think wouldn't, wouldn't exactly. Julian Alvarez would have been, that would have been perfect. Julian oh, Alvarez, yeah. would have been, there was so, it wouldn't even so be close. having this discussion, Dan, if Alvarez yeah. had arrived, like, like was planned. Definitely it not. felt You're so right. close, didn't it? But yeah, yeah. hey ho. Let's yeah. just get Emmy like, on it with the other Argentinian lads. Like, yeah, yes. he almost managed to convince Alvarez to come, but hopefully the next best thing will, will find his way to Birmingham. But guys, I'm going to have to wrap this up here because we've got a minute left on the recording. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on again. And guys, check out Hot by Six, check out Aaron on Twitter. Um, make sure you give him a follow because if you're not, then like you're just doing Twitter wrong. Um, and yeah, if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do so. Hit the bell so you know this podcast from us here at Heart of the Hulk. Up the Villa. Hola, Villa.